Sunday is that special time for us to get together and study the Word of God. We're so glad that you've joined us this morning for our presentation of Give Me the Bible. So go get your Bible, sit down, and let's study together from the pages of God's eternal Word right here on Give Me the Bible. Good morning, ladies and gentlemen. Let me ask you a, a real personal question here. How many friends do you have? Do you have a lot? Do you know Solomon said many years ago, he that would show himself friendly will have friends. You know, there was a serial on television one time entitled Friends. You know, we know a lot of people. We have a lot of acquaintances, but how many real friends do we have? Several years ago, a man wrote a book entitled The Friendship factor. This morning, we want to talk about friendship because the Bible deals with that subject so often. Uh, you know, Jesus had his friends. He had the 12. Then he had the inner circle, Peter, James, and John, and the one to whom he felt emotionally drawn and close was the apostle John. Matter of fact, he was the one to whom he entrusted the care of his own mother when he was suspended between heaven and earth upon the cross. This morning, we want to talk about friendship. You see, our relationships in this world are, are really fortified by deep and abiding friendships. I have some people that I have been friends with for a long, long time. Some have gone on to be with God, but others remain. I want to call on Randy Foreman, our first panel this morning on the Give Me the Bible program, to, to help us understand a little bit about this friendship. Randy? Thank you, Dan, and thank you so much for having me on the program again uh, this morning. You know, the question is, really, shouldn't we be strengthened through Christian associations? Inspiration tells us of the need to encourage one another. Evidently, the early Christians found strength and their friendships as they spent time together worshiping and praising God together. In Acts 2.42, Scripture records, and they devoted themselves to the apostles' teaching and the fellowship to the breaking of bread and the prayers. This is what the fellowship of believers looks like. Our corporate worship is designed by God to stir us up to love and good works. Hebrews 10, 24 and 25 says, And let us consider how to stir up one another to love and good works, not neglecting to meet together as is the habit of some, but encouraging one another, and all the more as you see the day drawing near. The Apostle John discusses the relationship he has with the Father and then shows how this relationship augments our fellowship with each other. In 1 John uh, 1, 3 and 4, inspiration records this. That which we have seen and heard, we proclaim also to you, so that you may uh, too have fellowship with us. And our fellowship is with the Father and with His Son, Jesus Christ. And we are writing these things so that our joy may be complete. The Holy Spirit has written things that together we may know the joy of our relationship in Christ. And this becomes the sacrifice of praise and love and adoration. In Acts and in Hebrews, we understand what Paul described in the letter to the brethren at Colossae. And above all things, put on love which binds everything together in perfect harmony. And let the peace of Christ rule in your hearts to which indeed you were called in one body. And be thankful. Let the word of Christ dwell in you richly, teaching and admonishing one another in all wisdom, singing psalms and hymns and spiritual songs with thankfulness in your hearts to God. And whatever you do in word or deed, do everything in the name of the Lord Jesus, giving thanks to God the Father through Him. Colossians 3, 14 through 17. This is our opportunity to be strengthened spiritually. Dan? Thank you, Randy, and what a wonderful opportunity it really is. We all want strength, uh, whether it be physical or spiritual, and we all like to have the encouragement that propels us to into a, a greater walk with our Father who is in heaven. 
You know, several years ago, Ricky Nelson sang the song, Where's This Place Called Lonely Street? <laughs> and Roy Orbison sang the song, Only the Lonely. You know how lonely in this life we get without <laughs> friends. Isn't it wonderful to know that when you feel lonely and you feel kind of melancholy that you can maybe get on your cell phone or text a friend and and maybe communicate a little bit. That don't, doesn't that really help us overcome our, our loneliness? People write sometimes to develop a relationship. They, they write to the Lonely Hearts Club. <laughs> I heard about a man who wrote to the Lonely Hearts Club one time, sent a picture, and they said, we're not that lonely yet. <laughs> well, let's go to Perry Cowan right now and help us understand, Perry, how we are strengthened and that we overcome our loneliness through what the Bible says. Dan, when you mentioned uh, Ricky and Roy and their songs, I was surprised that you didn't include Only the Lonely and Heartbreak Hotel by Elvis, you know, because they, they deal with this subject of loneliness. Loneliness is a, a problem that needs to be overcome. And folks, friendliness is an opportunity to overcome loneliness. It really is. It's a serious problem. There are so many people that are, they're, they're, just, they're just hungering for friendship. They're looking for that special close friends and, 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 and oftentimes when they don't find such, some people will even resort to taking their life because they are so lonely. Uh, my, my attention was brought to an ad that appeared in a newspaper. I didn't, didn't see the actual newspaper, but it's purported to be true. The, the newspaper ad read like this. I will listen to you talk for 30 minutes without comment for $5. That was the entirety of the ad, other than the phone number. And it's reported that in a later paper, it was revealed that this ad had been receiving between 10 and 20 calls a day. 10 and 20 calls a day. That's five to 10 hours of uninterrupted talk that someone was willing to give to those who are lonely. People are so hungry, so hungry for friendship that they'll try almost anything, even for this, this half hour of companionship. The American Council of Life Insurance reported that the most lonely people in America are, number one, college students. Now you'd think college students going off to be with their peers and a lot of people around them that surely they wouldn't be lonely. But remember, oftentimes it's the first time they've been away from home, away from their hometown, away from their friends that they grew up with. And loneliness overcomes them. It's followed by men and women who've been divorced, followed by welfare recipients, single mothers, rural students, students that don't live in a city but out in country areas where they don't have uh, as many neighbors as maybe others, housewives, housewives, because they don't have interaction with a lot of people throughout the day. And then the elderly, they are lonely. At some point, every one of us have experienced loneliness in some way. For some, it's just a, a, a fleeting thing. It doesn't last for long. For others, it's a lifelong experience. But when you're a Christian, remember this, you're never alone, never alone because the Lord Jesus said, lo, I am with you always, even unto the end of the age. We don't need to be foolish when we become lonely. We need to seek a friend. What worked in the first century for our Christians was that they joined together with other Christians. Folks, if you're lonely, Find a good church, a, a church that was established by the Lord Jesus Christ that's filled with Christians. They will love you and they will be friends to you. Why not give it a try? It worked in the first century and it'll work now. Dan? Well, Perry, it really does. You ever thought about all the songs that have been written about loneliness? 
I mentioned uh, Ricky Nelson a moment ago and Roy Orbis and Elvis and others, but think about Bobby Venton, the late Bobby Venton, who wrote the song uh, Mr. Lonely or Blue on Blue, Heartache on Heartache. Been many of them. But isn't it wonderful today that we can rejoice in the Lord and rejoice in real and genuine friendship? And let me tell you why that's true is because real friendship provides a lot of things. It provides love and support and encouragement for all of us who seek to do the will of God. Now, I want to call on Gene Greer, and Gene is the minister down in Elkhart, Texas, and good to have you back on the program today, Gene. And and, uh, tell us a little bit about this love and support that we get from the interaction as friends. Thank you, Dan. The Bible says that greater love has no man than this, that's when one laid down his life for another. Then there's another passage which says a friend loves at all time, and a brother is born of adversity, Proverbs 17, 17. And then Proverbs 18, 24, a man of many companions come to ruin, but there is a friend who sticks closer than a brother. You know, you look at those, and those type of friends sometimes are hard to find. But when you do, you find that a true fan will sharpen. And that is Proverbs 27, 17. Arm sharpens iron. And so a man sharpened the countenance of his friend. So a true friend will put an edge on your life. And if you want to know, just ask yourself the question about this friend, am I a better person for having known this purpose? And then number two, a true friend sticks. And that is, he's steadfast. You have Proverbs 17, 17. A friend loves at all time. And then he speaks of the brother that's born of adversity. So if you want to see who your real friend is, just make a mistake and see whether or not they might leave you. Some people will get on and off very easily, but a true friend is one who will stick with you. And then a true friend will stab you. You say, well, I don't want to be stabbed, but look at Proverbs 27, 6. Faithful are the wounds of a friend, but the kisses of an enemy is deceitful. That is, a friend who really loves you will wound you if necessary. There are examples of individuals who've done that, and I want to mention just very briefly Galatians chapter 2. Now, Paul has spent 15 days with Peter earlier, and here in this passage, he is given the right hand of fellowship with him, but then Peter makes a mistake. Peter is a, Gen- is a Jew, and he is visiting Antioch, and he's enjoying fellowship with the Gentiles. But when some people come from Jerusalem that thought they ought to be circumcised, well, Peter leaves them to the extent of his influence pulled Barnabas away. And Paul confronted his friend Peter to the face and said, Peter, you're wrong. And thus, if we have good friends... When we reach the point that perhaps we do something wrong, they will likewise do that same thing, that they will tell us that we're wrong, but they will stand with us in adversity and other times when we need them. So truly, there is a friend that sticks closer than their brother, and as mentioned, the greatest friend we have is Jesus Christ, who is no question but he's always there. Well, Gene, isn't that a wonderful thing to know that he is always there? He said, I'll never forsake you or leave you. Now, we're happy this morning also to uh, to have Neil Thurman with us. And Neil, you know, when I read the Bible, I understand that that friends are there for emotional support. They are. And uh, they undergird us with emotional support. And uh, this morning, I want to call on Neil to to address that and talk about the importance of it and uh, just how important emotional support really is. Neil? Dan, you're absolutely right. When we think about the sense of how we can be so 
tied up in, in the difficulties of, of life, struggling with them. You know, we can even find, you know, b- biblical characters. Paul saying there in 2 Timothy chapter 4, at verse 16, that at his first offense, no one stood with him, but that all forsook him. We can even find the sense of our Lord Jesus Christ when he goes to pray in the garden and he takes there with the three of Peter, James, and John. He leaves them and goes a little bit further. But when he comes back and he finds them asleep, he says there in Matthew chapter 26, and verse 40, could you not wait with me one hour? Sometimes when we deal with those problems of loneliness as Perry talked to us about or just having struggles in life and needing to recognize that we need some support. We need someone that we can lean on. This is a tough world to go through. It's a hard life if you have to do it alone. Recognize what the wise man tells us there in Proverbs 27 at verse 9 when he uh, says, "'Oil and perfume make the heart glad.'" So a man's counsel is sweet to his friends. When you have someone that will stand with you when you're alone, when you have someone that, as Gene has mentioned to us, when you step out of line, someone that cares about you enough that they would admonish you and let you know of your fault to give you that counsel. But the idea of not being alone, just having someone there to to build you up, to make you stronger, to to help you to see. We all know that it's more, it's easier to go through difficult times when we have someone with us. You remember what we read there in uh, in the book of Ecclesiastes, Ecclesiastes 4, verse 9 says, two are better than one because they have a good reward for their labor. For if they fall, one will lift up his companion, but woe to him who is alone when he falls, for he has no one to help him up. Again, if two lie down together, they will keep warm. But how can one be warm alone, though one may be overpowered by another, two can withstand and a threefold cord is not quickly broken. So Dan, if we could find that opportunity to have someone or a group of people that we can truly trust, that we can lean on for that emotional support, knowing that all of us go through times where we need that support. That brings it back to the point that you made for us in the idea that we need to have a church family. We need to have a spiritual family because in that family, we'll find those who not only will support us from an emotional standpoint, but they'll support us from a spiritual standpoint. So Dan, what we need to think about as we consider friends, one, be careful about who we choose, who we let that close in our lives, but especially we ought to look at where we're choosing from if we would find ourselves in a part of the church, part of an active and faithful congregation, I'll suggest to you we'll have a better or easier time finding that friend that will offer us that emotional support. Back to you, Dan. Thank you, Neil. Thank you so much. You know, there was a song that was uh, popular a number of years ago, and it was entitled, Friends Are Friends Forever, If the Lord's the Lord Above. And you know what? God is our friend. We often sing that old song, don't we? What a friend we have in Jesus. And what a friend we do have in Jesus Christ, our Lord. You know why friendship is so important? I want to say just a few words here in closing today, because I really believe in friendship and uh, friends are so important to me. I love my friends and I hope they love me and I know they do. They are there for me. They encourage me. They lift me up. And certainly that's what Christ does for us as well. The book of Proverbs chapter 17 and verse 17 says that friends are friends forever. I guess it inspired that song. But the latter part of that verse says, for a man is born to adversity. In this life, we're going to have difficulties. We are. We're going to have those adverse moments. And I'm going to tell you something freely. There have been times when adversity came my way and I depended upon my friends. And had it not been for my friends, I don't know what I would have done. I really don't. 
I love and appreciate them so much because they've been there to, as we've already suggested throughout this telecast today, to love us, to support us, to help us emotionally, and as Randy mentioned earlier in the program, to give us spiritual strength that guides us into the future. You know, friends really are dear, aren't they? Have you ever thought about it, though? How many friends do you really have? Oh, you probably have a lot of acquaintances, as I mentioned in the onset of our lesson today. We know a lot of people, but how many people are really friends? That you could pick up that phone and call them, and they would be there with you if you were going through that adverse time. Or perhaps if you had a special need that you couldn't meet and you needed someone there to help you, would they come? Would they come in the middle of the night? The Bible talks about those who would. They would come whether it was day or whether it was night. And you know what? That's what a friend is. A friend will be with you, as someone said, they will walk in the front door when everyone else has gone out the back door. Sometimes we find it difficult to make friends. I've heard people say, well, you know, I'm just not a friendly person. Well, you can change that. (laughs) Sometimes I hear people say, well, I wish I had more friends. You know what? Practice what Solomon said. Go out and be a friend. The best way in the world to make friends is to be a friend. We sing the song, I'll be a friend to Jesus. You know what Jesus said about friends? He said, my friends are those who do the will of God. Now, I have acquaintances and I have friends that are not Christians, but my real deep inner circle of friends are those who share the common faith that I have in Christ Jesus, my Lord. And I'm so thankful for the bond that holds us together. And that really is what the church is about. You know, we hear about support groups today Uh, maybe divorce recovery groups or uh, uh, people who are grieving maybe because of the loss of a loved one, maybe a, a father or mother or maybe a child. And you come together for that grief counsel. Well, did you know in reality that the church is just simply a support group? When Jesus designed the church, he designed it as an organization for support spiritually, that we might receive that support that we needed in life. The Bible calls it fellowship. It's the Greek word koinonia, and it means the interaction. Uh, Sometimes people we call friends we haven't talked to in years. What kind of friend is that? Or what kind of friend would one be if when you call they had other things to do or they refused to come? That's not what the church is about. The church is about developing a stronger relationship with each other. I'm so thankful that you've joined us today for our telecast right here on Give Me the Bible. I want to tell you about a a little DVD that we're offering simply because we want you to be our friend. And um, we can't buy friendship. That's the reason we don't charge for this DVD. It is free of charge. We'd like to send it to you. We'd like you to know more about God. And this DVD will point you back to the Bible, to those scriptures, and answer to many of your questions about life and salvation. You know, the Bible teaches that we are saved as a result of our faith and our obedience to Christ and baptism. And when we begin to walk in that newness of life, we hold on to God until the end. Christ said, be thou faithful unto death and I'll give you the crown of life. And I'm going to tell you something. That came from your best friend and that's Jesus Christ. And we give you that same friendship today. Thank you for joining us. Please join us next week right here on this same station for another presentation of Give Me the Bible.
servants sing the song of peace. From the toils that by me it will bring release. Burdens will be lifted, none oppressing so. Showers of great blessing o'er my heart will flow. Sing the symphony of heaven, let me find me dream of its golden glory. Of its pearly gleam. Sing to, sing to me, me when shadows of the evening, the evening fall. Sing to, sing to me, me of heaven, sing the sweetest song of all. Sing to me of heaven tenderly and low. Feel the shadows on me rise and swiftly go. When my heart is 